All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'll open uh, this session with the end, basically. <clears throat> so the question I was uh, asked to address is how to develop a scientific collaboration with Italy. This is, of course, a very difficult question. It uh, can be a successful question. Uh, in fact, uh, as you see in the, in the, in the slide, uh, I hold a dual appointment uh, in, um, at the Yale University, where I'm a deputy director of the Liver Center, and um, in Italy, where, to my surprise, I have more respons administrative responsibility than I originally thought I would ever have. So, how to develop scientific collaboration with Italy? But first of all, we need to ask three questions, okay? First of all, why? Second, who benefits? And then we go to the last question, how? So why? Um, I don't know why, but what I know is that every Italian abroad has this willingness to remain close to his own country. And this is not only true for Italian, it's true for everybody. And uh, even if uh, we are uh, far away from Italy, um, in a way, this is a personal choice. It's not that we are here because we have been deported. It's here because we uh, wanted to have more opportunity. Uh, we wanted to work in a place where the academic governance is better. We wanted to work in a place where the, uh, the opportunity and the funding of research uh, is, um, is run in a more meritocratic way. But at the end, it's a choice that we make. It's nobody forces us. And I think this um, clearly, um, in a way, um, drives us to have this closeness to Italy. And, and this idea that we should probably give back, um, also because we all realize that our parents uh, did not have to do all the sacrifices that they are doing here if you want to <coughs> go through the university in, in this country. And we, in a, in a way or the other, had an excellent education that was completely or almost free of, uh, of charge. And so I, I think that the idea that <coughs> why is clearly written in our genome and is written in our stories. Who benefits? I think everybody benefits out of that. I mean, Clearly, for, for Italy, there is a great advantage in uh, remaining in contact with the so-called uh, brain that <coughs> belongs to this diaspora. And uh, as uh, one of the uh, Italian Ministry of uh, Health uh, said uh, once in a very cynical way, well, the real worth of an Italian abroad is if he stays abroad. That's a shocking uh, <coughs> um, phrase, but what he meant was that clearly there's a value of, that comes back to Italy for all the people that is here if we remain connected. But also I believe, and I hope I'll be, show, I'll be able to show you some evidence of that, there's a great, great opportunity also for institution of these countries to keep exploiting uh, this international collaboration. And, and I think that yesterday, uh, Professor Camillo Ricordi clearly gave us a, a, a great overview, a great hint uh, of what uh, advantages are in, in the new era in having these interconnections. <clears throat> then we go to the question of how. And here uh, the picture gets really fuzzy because how it's a matter of opportunities how it's a matter of your life history, and how it's a matter of having a clear understanding where you want to go, and that's the strategy, but being flexible with the tactics. You wanna remain connect with Italy, connected, but it's not easy at the beginning to be able to uh, scheme a, a path to be able to do this, but you should really remain open to all the uh, daily opportunities that your professional life is going to provide you and exploit them if your ultimate goal is to remain connected with your own country in a positive and fruitful way. So several years ago in Milano, 
I was asked uh, to speak at, at the uh, meeting organized by the University of Milano on the internationalization, I guess, of biomedical research. And, and the question I asked was, is that natural evolution or intelligent design? So natural evolution is what happens usually, okay? We all go abroad, we develop our network, uh, and we remain connected to the scientific network. Mm -hmm. And, and if you look at uh, all these individual stories from, from above, like using these big data analysis systems, it will look like a flock of birds. It will look like a swarm, okay? This continuous interaction going on between U.S. and, uh, and Italy, in, in this specific case, are thousands and thousands of eats every year, even more. But the impression is that they serve to some personal purposes, but at the end, it's like a, a flock of birds that moves and moves and moves, but remain in the same place, okay? Yet, it's changing continuously. It is so because it's, it's not organized. It doesn't follow an intelligent design in this case. Intelligent design is where situation in which two institutions start talking between each other because they recognize a mutual advantage through the use of common platforms, the use of common researchers, and uh, eventually be able to apply for common grants. So although all of us, as LinkedIn would, would show you, have a, a myriad of connections international, not always the connection in terms of overall system create a benefit because they are not organized. So what does it take to use an intelligent design in organizing your uh, <coughs> connection with Italy? Well, let, let, let's put the case, for example, the Yale Medical School. The Yale Medical School has only 364 students, but these are highly selected with an acceptance rate of 6%. It has 1,500 faculty to take care of these 300 students, you know, where, <laughs> when you see when you see this in Italy, they say, "Oh wow, we have 20 students per faculty," <laughs> and it's considered to be lost. I mean, to be tiny, there should be less faculty. So there's a lot of postdocs. The operating budget is close to one billion dollar, both for clinical and NIH tests. 400 active patients, uh, 35 biotech companies, 12 affiliated hospitals, and a million patient encounters. So here we have this giant. Hmm? And I interview, and, and this is a global institution because the faculty search is worldwide. There's no nationality here. They go after what they need, no matter what. And they, they go after the best. The, these results in a very diversified faculty in terms of nationality, ethnic background, gender. Half of the students have fair foreign nationality and has uh, several missions in developing countries. In fact, as you heard from the, from the newspapers, a uh, few students uh, were actually uh, quarantined because they were coming from places where Ebola was epidemic. There's a strong partnership with, uh, with China. We had like 50 extremely selected students from China every year. And there's a close partnership with the University College of London. So, I inter so uh, this is the University of Milano Bicocca. It's a very young university, founded uh, like uh, 18 years ago. 32,000 students, multi-faculty. Uh, it's a unique campus structure that was um, <coughs> derived uh, from the headquarters of the Pirelli Corporation uh, in Milano. Um, there are uh, several, uh, there are uh, numerous international students from several sources and uh, ranks 21 worldwide among the university that are less than 50 years old. I, I don't know what that means. As you know, no Italian university ranks uh, above uh, 
now below 180, I think, or something like that. But it is the second among the Italian universities, even if it is the youngest. So I interviewed the dean and I said, Dean Alpha, what makes you deciding whether or not you can use intelligent design to develop a relationship with other institutions abroad? Well, he said, freezing me immediately. <laughs> and they have to be institutions of similar academic prestige. They're not interested in unequal relationships. And they, there he was referring to the uh, collaboration with the um, uh, <coughs> University College in London. It has to be opportunities for mutual improvement. So both of us must improve out of this relationship. There has to be big science projects, not petty projects. We need to go after the big science. And we need to form recognized entity that have the capability of applying for grants in both countries. And this is a key, a key element of the whole architecture. <laughs> Lastly, talk to me only if you have a fully financed project. And this is a lesson that I learned in my interaction with the states. You, you, you can't sit down with somebody unless you really have already done all your own work and all your uh, fundraising, because they listen to anything which is reasonably funding, okay? So that was the situation. So how it happened that we develop uh, anyway this collaboration? This goes back in uh, 2005, because there's another secret you have to know. If they want you, they'll do anything to have you when they need to recruit you. And that is the key moment in which you have to be able to define your next 10 years. This is where you have to ask. You have to be able to ask at the proper time. So once they are hooked, then you put down <laughs> your requests, okay? In my time, my request was, well, I want to stay connected with the hospital of Bergamo because there we develop uh, the biggest uh, pediatric liver transplant in Europe. Uh, there we had developed a great uh, transplantation center. There there is a, a laboratory and there are 1.5 million euros of donation that I don't want to leave there. So after some bargaining, they decided that that was a good thing to do. Okay, particularly because there was $1.5 million from private foundations. And so we started with this um, <coughs> joint program. And, and, and what do you need to have a joint program? In, in order to sell it, you need to have a clear definition of what you want to do. And that time was that we wanted to translate the reparative regenerative capabilities of the liver into clinical application. That was the overarching statement in which we developed this scientific collaboration. And in fact, there were lines of research about hepatic progenitor cells, the treatment of end-stage liver diseases with the idea that we could either substitute, which was our daily work as a transplant person, or maintain the organ function, or the function of the failing organ. And then we were active in the liver cancer field. You have to define the partners, and the partners in this case were Saliver, uh, this, this laboratory and foundation who was holding the money, Yale University who was hosting me and, and, and putting his own great laboratories at our disposal, and, and Milano Bicocca who provided the academic coverage. Then you have to define the deliverables. And these deliverables had to be uh, shared by both institutions. Of course, there is scientific publication. This is our job. Also research training for students, PhD, postdocs, and, and, and rotation in a master program of <coughs> medicina di trapianti. Uh, as, as Professor Ricordi said yesterday, the biggest problem I found was in the uh, technology transfer agreement. And I used to say, I I'm not gonna discover anything, I swear. But <laughs> even though, <laughs> potentially, 
So that, that was the main difficulty. But again, if there are clear projects behind and, and money and everything, they're gonna solve the question. So then, in 2008, the University of Milano Bicocca decided to um, use the return of the value mechanism to bring this brain back. And they say, well, you know, we have a lot uh, of interest uh, in digestive diseases. And this is what it was, okay? When I say the desert, I mean, there was not a lab, there was not a department, there was not a office, nor a chair, no any plan for me to do even a lesson, okay? And there wasn't even the ordinary position that they promised, okay? There was an associate pro position and I was full tenure, full professor at Yale University. So that's lesson number two. You're gonna eat a lot of bad food. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanna do that, okay? Don't be stinky. Don't think you're a great professor from the US because they don't care. You know, there's a big plate of bad smelling food for you <laughs> to eat. But if you can do it, then you can be successful. But be humble. Be humble and remember you're dealing with a, unfortunately a fully different uh, uh, system. But you can navigate this system as I showed you in the first slide, okay? Just be true to yourself. Don't take vicious uh, habits from your colleagues. So after a while, this is now digestive diseases at UNIBIB. So it's part of the School of Medicine, is in the Department of Translational Medical and Surgery. There is a section of digestive diseases that has two uh, clinical uh, units, one in the San Gerardo Hospital, the other in, in the uh, Niguarda Hospital. There is a GI fellowship, we call specialty. There's a master in transplantation medicine and advanced pathology. And then there is this center that we created, that was the evolution of the original center, which is called Center for Digestive Health, that include the liver lab in Milano, include the salivary, include the center for uh, public health, in Milano, and the Yeli Liver Center and the people in the Niguarda Hospital. This is, these are the two um, hospitals in which the section spans. The one on the left uh, is the Niguarda Hospital, is the biggest hub hospital in Milano, and the one is the San Gerardo Hospital. So the, whole, the, the two hospitals are just gigantic. I, I, I'm not gonna go through this. So, but, <coughs> The powerhouse that is uh, represented by the joint uh, operation of these two GI units is great. There are 24, oh, 22 beds, so 46 beds. There are altogether 1,500 admissions per year, um, 11,000 clinic visits, four programs, uh, 11,000 endoscopies, and, and the liver transplant center in, in, in Niguarda that actually performs more than 90 transplants per year. Now, part of this was there, of course, you know. All I had to do was to assemble. Assemble this under a meaningful theme and proposition. I see this is an incredible powerhouse because when we had to run a study, in 18 months, we prospectively collected 1,700 patients with cirrhosis, 700 with hepatocellular carcinoma, 1,500 patients with hepatitis C, and so on and so forth. It's a huge clinical machine. And then the exchange program, we had like 18 summer students, five PhD students that we exchanged, people coming from Milano Bicocca to the US, and down for, to nine full-time faculty members of Yale University that spent some time in, uh, in Milano with us. Lastly, <laughs> we also developed a, an interest uh, in, in the sustainability of care debate. 
which is a big thing. Okay, yesterday I mentioned about the fact that we have a cure for hepatitis C, but we don't have the money to provide that cure to all the people that need them. So there's a whole area of interest here, which is called value-based medicine, and the idea is to find ways to obtain the best outcome at an affordable cost. This is an idea that is being uh, promoted by Michael Porter, who is one of the most famous uh, professor of business administration at Harvard University. He is the proponent of the competitive advantage of the um, firms. Uh, he's an expert in competition, and, and uh, Elizabeth Taysberg. Well, how this started? This started one day in New Haven. I was terribly depressed after a transplantation clinic in which I thought they could not provide care to several people just because they were in condition of, they were frail. They had a frail uh, support in terms of family and they were frail economically and we were not providing them care. So I said, the hell with it, let me take a walk. And I walked by the uh, bookstore and I found this book, 600 pages, I read it. This became a study which was sponsored with one million euro by the Ministry of Health and the region of Lombardy uh, designed to find the outcome indicators for all liver diseases. And this became a major topic last week at the uh, International Hepatology meeting, but also was fully endorsed by a university who is now redesigning the um, liver, the clinical liver center according to this idea. So this idea originated from Harvard, mm. went back to Milano Lombardy and bounced back to the institution in which bookstore, I read this book, and becoming one of the way they're trying to address this changing environment. So um, this is all the people that belongs to the International Center of Digestive Health. So at the end, there is not a codified way to organize these uh, collaborations. They clearly shapes, take shape along your life and along, along your operosity and your willingness to keep in mind every step you make, that you come from Italy, that you have this binding relationship, and you're gonna go at that added value every time you do something. And of course, I have to acknowledge a whole lot of uh, uh, entities and bodies and everything that supported us with their generosity, okay? And I hope, uh, so I'm not seeing, I know it's, uh, uh, Vito is here, that one of the activities that the Italian chapter of ISNEF uh, can do would be to try to provide money for people, you know, some seeding money to help uh, these joint programs, which is different from sending somebody to study uh, in the U.S. and to work in the U.S. There should be uh, fundraising to find the money so that each of us with good project can sit down with the dean and say, okay, I have some pocket money just to show you that there are people that believe in what I'm going to do. And uh, with that, I'm done. Thank you.